Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, I ask culture critic Jeff Chang, are we really going to be all right? We hear from more voices at Standing Rock, and I share a few thoughts about being stressed out and doing it anyway. That's all coming up on the Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take the back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Our next guest is one of our closest and best observers of American society, culture, and, well, let's face it, us. He's the author of the bestseller, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A History of the Hip-Hop Generation, and he's out with a new book, We Gone Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation. It's just out from Picador. Jeff Chang is also executive director of the Institute for Diversity in the Arts at Stanford University, and I'm very happy to have him back on the program. Jeff, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's great to be back. We gonna be all right. Can I get a guarantee in that? Um, I I hesitate to give you a guarantee, but I, <laughs> so many things are happening these days, right? But really, is on the front of your book. Do you promise? Are we gonna be all right? I can't and promise. Why do you think I can't it? promise. It's an aspiration. And I think that if we're working together, we might be able to make it a reality. It is a pretty optimistic book. But at it the is. same time, you describe what you call a new geography of race, which is not cheerful at all, at least not when it comes to integration. No, not at all. I, you know, I think what we've seen over the last 30, 40 years is uh, a reversal of the old kinds of terms of white flight. Um, what we saw you know, back after World War II, moving into the 70s and the 80s, was steady white flight from the cities into the suburbs. And what we've seen from the 90s on has been white wealth moving back into the cities. Uh, and so we describe this as gentrification, this mm -hmm. process of gentrification. And of course, many cities, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, this is topic one, right? Um, but I feel like gentrification is too small a word to describe what's actually going on because it centers the wealth moving in, gentry, right? Um, and it in fact disappears the people who have been displaced. And so those people are moving, they have to live somewhere. They're moving and they've been moving to suburbs with names like Sanford, Florida and Ferguson, Missouri. Let's come back to the thrust of your book, which has to do with how do we restitch a movement and a society for equity for all. And, and, I, and I was so struck reading your book because it's essay after essay, and each one more or less ends with saying, people need to get it. This is for us all, y'all. You know? <laughs> uh, and it reminded me of you know, Anna Julia Cooper, abolitionist, suffragist, speaking to a Parisian gathering of, of women's rights activists in the 1890s and calling on women and women of color. She used the great phrase, we are seeking not a gateway for our own, but a grand highway for humanity. Mm -hmm. She's the same person that said, you know, a bridge is only as strong as its weakest link. Mm -hmm. Why is it so hard to move justice forward in a way that people don't do a zero-sum ga game thing, where justice for you means some less for me, but rather this is gain for all. And right. where do you see it happening, do you? Yeah, I do see it happening. I mean, I think that, that, that you have to really go back to like the early days of this sort of inflection point for the Black Lives Matter movement and look at you know, writing that people like Alicia Garza um, had put out there when she said, um, liberation for African Americans is liberation for all. Yeah. Um, I think that that's exactly why the movement has been so powerful, has continued to gain uh, strength and steam, and now has put out a platform that really, it's, it's a movement for black lives platform, um, but this is, I, I think, a really amazing roadmap for us to be able to think about what a new America can look like. I think that we're all struggling for visions, and I think this is one of the best visions that we've seen yet. Are the um, people who are right now excited about Donald Trump as we're talking in the run-up to this election, are they in that America? Yes, they have to be. I think that they have to be. I think one of the, the interesting kinds of, not planks, but there's a, a definitional glossary in there, uh, and there's a word in there, transformational justice, right? And I think that um, what this idea kind of evokes is that those who have been harmed the most need to be able to be the ones who lead us to think about what we need to do in order to create a new society, right? 
So we get but, Alicia Garza to meet with the Trump supporters? We try to persuade them to listen to what she has to say? How do we do that? I think that it's it's about trying to trying to convince people that this is something that, that helps everybody. And I'm not saying that this is easy work, right? Um, and I think that there's been this long-standing debate in the left about, like, is it class or is it identity? Which right? we've been seeing a lot this election season. Absolutely. And I think that you see it uh, across the board from debates over what's happening with student protests on campus um, all the way down to, you know, what's been happening with Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton um, and this sort of race, class, like, both gender, like, what's going on? Like, how do we think about it? I mean, it's sort of all at once, stupid. So why don't we try to figure out how folks can find points of commonality and move together. Um, I think that that's the big question. Uh, and I think that that's the question that faces us as we're moving into more and more demographically diverse um, society that's continuing to resegregate. So, you know, to me, the, 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 the really interesting work is happening at these intersections, right? It's happening when uh, BLM folks are, are going to Standing Rock, right? It's happening when uh, the undocumented movement is, is thinking about uh, what it means um, to, to work on anti-blackness in migrant and immigrant communities. Um, it's happening when folks put all of this type of stuff together and say, what does economic justice look like for all? Um, we have to start with the fact that resegregation um, has created huger and huger gaps on wealth and income, particularly for black and brown communities. But how do, or and how do we confront the out and out racism that has also surfaced in, in this election campaign, which is to say has always been around, we haven't addressed it. Um, do we, do progressives vie for the loyalty of those white, right racists who have come out of the woodwork in this campaign? I think that it's about offering an alternative, right? And I think that, that if we're going to look at the, the number of, of racists who have been emboldened by the sort of Trumpism movement, right, um, that's still a very small number. Right. Um, but we're still, we've still got to be in play uh, for, I think, a lot of those folks who have been disenfranchised. Um, by the economy, by uh, what they see as, as globalization that's uh, been impacting them unfairly, um, by people whose places, whose home places uh, are, have been um, completely devastated by neoliberalism. Like this is part of the work that needs to be done. Um, but we haven't been able to, I think, articulate uh, that kind of message. So talk to that today's hip hop generation whatever the equivalent is today, many of whom are feeling super engaged in movement work, super engaged in cultural work, um, but maybe less engaged in political and, and, and policy work, some of them. Um, how are you thinking about this election? Um, and do you have any advice to them? Well, I mean, I th you know, the election is, is, is a, a means to a larger end, right? Um, it's not it's not the revolution. I think that we've all kind of come to that conclusion a long time ago, right? I, I mean, noticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it bears repeating uh, all the time, especially when you feel like you're being inundated with all of this kind of stuff nonstop. But it's literally about uh, thinking, you know, past the current moment and, and, and towards the, the long run. What does that look like? Um, and so it's about building up uh, local movement. It's a, and it's about uh, uh, being able to, to go where the folks are at, right? I mean, folks are in the culture all day, every day. Yeah. Uh, folks come to the polls, you know, periodically, uh, sometimes not at all. No, but I, I, I mean, I'm joking, but I mean that that, that type of stuff is, is episodic. And, and what continues to push people um, is, is the movement work. Uh, and so that's where the work is, for sure. You end the book with, with talking about your own Asian Americanness. Um, want to share any of that very beautiful meditation about where you fit into all this? For sure. I, you know, I, uh, my editor kept on telling me, you know, as I was writing the book, you know, there needs to be more you in this. Editors and tend I, to say that. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we love them. Uh, 
what, you know, when we're not cursing them out, like, ah, I can't believe they told me to do that. But, um, but no, my editor, Anna DeVries, is really awesome. And she said, you know, there's got to be more of you this, in this. And uh, I said, it's implied, right? I mean, there's, a, there's sort of a, but it's, it wasn't. And, and I think simultaneously to that, or maybe in part because of that, just like all kinds of things are kind of happening. Um, but I, I, you know, the book in a lot of ways is, um, is a thank you note to the Movement for Black Lives for raising these questions of, um, of what have happened in this country um, and putting them back, pushing them back to the center of the table and saying we have to deal with this. Um, and I couldn't uh, write a book that was a thank you note without reflecting on how that's um, made me ask questions about my role and positionality in relationship to um, the movement for black lives and to um, the black liberation struggle, the black freedom struggle in general. So that's partly where the essay came from. But at the same time, um, I wanted to try to be true to my own histories that have made me and my own kind of, um, um, hmm. uh, my communities, I'm Chinese and Native Hawaiian, my own communities sort of um, troubled relationship, uh, I think, with questions, questions of racial justice, my own community's anti-blackness. And so that was where the essays, the in-betweens came from, were always placed in between white and black. And the advantage, the privilege of being in between is you can sit on the sidelines. You can choose not to engage. Um, you can choose to sit out the battle, right? Uh, and just sort of plow away and do your thing and, and, and you know, figure out how to, how to, how to uh, play the game, right? Um, but, you know, there's a song that they revived in Ferguson, um, and it's the old song from the coal miners' fights in Appalachia, um, which I think is a really beautiful kind of consonance, right? And it's the song, Which Side Are You On? And I think that, you know, this is a moment in which folks really have to choose which side that they're on. Yeah. There's a line in there, there are no neutrals here in Harlan County, there's no neutrals. In Ferguson, there were no neutrals. We went to cover the anniversary of uh, Michael Brown's killing, and, you know, we were there as, as uh, journalists, uh, as documentarians, right? I was there with two, uh, you know, good young friends of mine who had cameras, right? I had my notebook. Um, and when the protests happened, the police were like, we're arresting everybody. We don't care if you're an observer, if you're a journalist, if you just co come back from your chemotherapy appointment. Um, you, we don't care if you're 70 or 80 years old, you're all arrested. And so they told us what side they were on, yeah. and there's no way that we could have said, well, I, yeah. I'm out of this, you know? And I think that that's a, sort of a metaphor for, for in general, um, uh, for Asian Americans, for Pacific Islanders, um, which side are we on? And, and so the, the in-betweens kind of comes from that. So I'm hearing if we figure out which side we're on, and if we lean a little across the line, yeah. maybe we're going to be all right. I think so. I think, I think that, that I, I'm a glass half full type of person. But, I, you know, but I'm inspired by people like you know, Grace Lee Boggs and, um, you know, and all the, the thinkers that kind of, whom have caught, followed in her wake. Uh, and she, you know, she lived to be 100 and was hopeful you know, to her very last breath. Um, that we could all figure it out. And, and so I, I try to maintain that as well. Not to mention, she always said, fighting the good fight keeps you young and healthy. <laughs> <laughs> she was proof of it. Jeff Chang's new book is We Gonna Be All Right, Notes on Race and Resegregation. It's just out from Picador. Always great to talk with you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. It's always great to talk to you, too.